All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Duncan and I am a consultant librarian with Peace Library System. Today we are going to be going over some Alberta-based publishers, um, Alberta-based booksellers, and the Read Alberta ebook collection. So today's webinar is kind of like a mixed bag of Alberta-related resources. Um, some of these you might already know or have heard of, and others might be brand new to you. So hopefully you leave today with having learned some new resource or new tool that can help you uh, find Alberta content, find local content that you can bring into your library. I'm going to do a land acknowledgement. Peace Library System acknowledges that we are located on the Treaty 8 territory of the Cree, Beaver, and Diné people and Region 6 of the Métis Nation of Alberta. We are grateful to live, work, and learn together on this land, which has been home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples since time immemorial. We recognize this land as an act of reconciliation, and we also commit to supporting and celebrating our local Indigenous communities while working to break down institutional barriers to make our libraries equitable and accessible. All right, so let's jump right in. And our first question is why Alberta content? When I say Alberta content, what I'm really getting at are stories and materials that reflect uh, our own lives or our patrons' lives in an authentic or familiar way. And there are many reasons why we should actively seek out books by Albertan authors or stories that have those Albertan settings or even Albertan themes, um, even a Canadian setting, uh, emphasizing the Canadian experience uh, of materials in the library. Because Alberta content or local content rather, uh, does not necessarily mean that it has to be written by someone who lives in your community or that every part of the story is set in your community or set in Alberta, right? There are many things in Alberta that are, that are recognizable to uh, residents of the province that can uh, meet, meet that same criteria. So things like the Rocky Mountains, um, prairies, uh, maybe specific animals like moose, uh, West Edmonton Mall, uh, these are all things that are familiar to Albertans and could be considered local content or Alberta content. So if you find books that have these themes in them, um, definitely worthwhile to, uh, to bring in. Because sometimes it can be a little bit difficult um, or maybe just not as common. Maybe it's not as top of mind as uh, finding books that have a New York setting or uh, a Miami setting or something like that. It can be a little harder to navigate and find those Alberta specific, those Alberta themed uh, materials. But this is why we're doing this today, because we're going to highlight some resources to find those materials. Now for local authors, um, writing about their own communities can showcase a particular town, uh, maybe a neighborhood or an area in a really authentic way. And that's because they're familiar with it, right? Oftentimes local authors have grown up in the community and they're writing based on what they know. Um, so they're using their lived experiences and that can make local readers connect more easily to materials um, and, and really build a powerful connection. Um, if you do find materials by local authors, like people who are directly living in your community, it might be a really good idea to bring in those authors into the library because that can increase the experience for your patrons and uh, build those connections from reader to author and um, you know relate on their shared experience. But before we move any further, I'm gonna talk about self-published materials. Um, so that being said about local authors, it's, it's great to have local content and have those local authors in the library. However, I would always make sure that if you are advertising local books or self-published books rather, that it is based on, on their own merit. Um, and what I mean by that is oftentimes self-published materials are the author is paying a publisher to make copies of their book um, or they're creating their own copies and they're, own, they're doing their own distribution and advertising. Um, so they're not really getting any assistance from a, a more established publisher or even an in, independent publisher. Um, with self-publishing, there isn't really a vetting process. So there might be um, content, uh, spelling errors even, or just general things overlooked that might not fly in your community or 
really go over well um, with patrons. Um, we want to make sure we're bringing in quality uh, content, uh, content that has uh, value and is bringing value to uh, the patrons. If you do have authors who are coming to the library or contacting your library um, with their self-published materials and you're just not sure on whether or not it is uh, something of value um, or quality, you can definitely contact uh, anyone in the consulting department and we can help to support and uh, determine whether or not uh, the, the item is, is appropriate or not. I was doing some research and I did find an article from ALA about self-published authors in the library. And I just wanna read out uh, some of this content because it makes a lot of sense in my mind and it really helps me to understand um, why libraries can sometimes be a little bit wary of self-published materials. But this is what it says. It says, quote, uh, publishers tend to establish expertise in certain fields, and this is taken into consideration in evaluating a title, especially one for which reviews are not available. Selectors, or in this case, maybe library managers or those who are doing the collection development in the library, uh, selectors try to be familiar with publishers and their specialties, but this is harder and harder to do in an age of mergers and takeovers. Some publishers in each field produce titles of such quality that selection decisions can be made solely on the basis of the publisher. So what that means is that publishers like uh, uh, Penguin or a Random House, um, Tor Books, right? These are established publishers. We know that by the time the book is published and on the shelf at the bookstore or available to purchase online, that it's gone through a vetting process, it's been reviewed, um, there's like often whole teams of people who are working behind this single book. So we know that it's quality content. Uh, Self-published materials do not go through that same process. So we can't uh, as easily determine whether or not it brings any value or if it is uh, of quality. Uh, what else? Conversely, some publishers who produce marginal works are avoided unless a certain item receives excellent reviews. So it's not to say that self-published materials need to be um, eliminated from the library. Um, we're just more selective about it. The library generally avoids vanity presses where the author pays publication costs and do their own distribution. Self-published and desktop publishers produce works of varying quality and are seldom reviewed. These items are generally not purchased unless the subject is in high demand and the book is examined to be found of merit. Okay. And that is from an article by uh, Andrea Jamieson on the ALA website titled, Where Do We Stand? Libraries and Self-Published Authors. So that's uh, giving credit. Um, so when we say the book is examined and found to be of merit, so maybe this is something like a community cookbook, right? A community cookbook is maybe not going to go through uh, a major publisher or an independent publisher, but the quality is there. We know that this is something of merit that people or patrons in the community are probably going to want to check out, even if we're just having it in as a reference book. Um, so something like that, I would definitely say, yeah, go for it, bring it in, let's have it available to patrons. Uh, again, if you do have authors with self-published materials who are contacting you about getting their stuff in the library, um, you can always do a double check, right? Is it available on Indigo or other bookstore websites? Um, is their title available in another Alberta library? Is it in the Edmonton Public Library collection or the Calgary Public Library collection? And if it's not, we might want to consider why that is, um, why, why their book is not being, uh, I guess, accepted into these uh, larger system collections. But I wouldn't get too caught up in trying to locate authors that are directly in your community. Um, like I said before, local can mean a setting or just a general familiarity with the content. So I have some examples here. These are some books that are not necessarily about Alberta or written by Albertan authors, but they include parts and themes that are set in Alberta. And that can be really exciting for the reader. So this is The Last Crossing, uh, The Garneau Block, oh, and Wildwood. So I believe The Last Crossing actually takes, uh, the story takes place across, uh, I think, Montana and Alberta. So it has that kind of interesting crossover. Um, and the Garneau block uh, 
I think is mainly set in Edmonton, which is kind of neat. All three of these are also available in Track Pack if you're interested in checking them out and reading more about them. And these are some for young readers. So for young readers, material written by local authors or books with those local settings and themes can really help them to understand their own experience growing up, right? It offers opportunities for children to make connections to themselves and their surroundings. And it shows that to young readers that their experiences, the Alberta experience is worthy of appearing in literature and that their struggles and their successes are valid. Um, can be a really relatable way for for local readers to connect with characters that think, live, look, or act like they do. And it's fun. It's really fun. Recognizing a street name or an area um, or a person that's depicted in the book makes the story more appealing and, and really engages readers more so um, than settings that are maybe outside their own lived experience. Okay. Knowing that a book is written by a local author um, can also be inspiring. It shows that you don't need to live in a huge city like Toronto or New York to be an author. Um, we're connecting young readers with books by Albertan authors, and that can inspire kids to consider writing as a career path, right? They're able to visualize and, and see people who grew up in a similar situation and similar communities, and now they're authors and, and writers, and that can be really powerful for young readers. And to introduce these books to patrons can be really easy too, right? We don't have to um, order these in uh, and then worry that they're gonna get lost in circulation. Create a display, right? Uh, a little poster, maybe on your bulletin board, a social media post, new books uh, by Albertan authors, or maybe even uh, like a book display at the front desk and have book stands and a whole array that patrons can choose from. Um, and again, these titles are not all necessarily written by Albertan authors, but they have that familiar content and themes that would be appropriate for an Albertan audience. So for example, Oliver Jeffers is not Albertan. I don't even think he's Canadian, but um, the Moose and the Rocky Mountains, right? These are things that will connect uh, to Albertan readers and, and be familiar to them. These other two titles, uh, Sierra and Blue Go to Town and Howdy, I'm Flores Ledoux, are both by uh, Albertan authors. And this one in the middle here is actually uh, from an Albertan uh, publisher, which is really cool. And these are all available on Track Pack as well, if you're interested. All right, I'm gonna spend some time showing some websites and resources that you can use to find uh, Alberta content, local content, Canadian content, whatever your, whatever your cup of tea is. And the first one is the Writers Guild of Alberta. So the Writers Guild of Alberta is a community of Alberta writers from all across the province. So it encompasses every genre, every level of skill. Um, and for writers, this would be a really great organization to join um, as they have many resources and services for writers. So they do things like social events, podcasts, webinars. I believe they even do an annual conference. So if you have writers or maybe a writer's group in the library and they're not aware of this, um, this might be something to point them towards. Uh, some notable highlights from this uh, site include their annual literary awards, which recognize lit uh, literary excellence in Alberta. Um, and Rosemary actually sends out a program for these, and I believe it's coming up soon, the program she's going to send. So you'll be able to view who the nominees are of this uh, book awards and you can check off which ones you like and uh, send it back and you'll get them. Um, another one is this Alberta magazine subscription box. Um, so Alberta content is not just limited to novels and the picture books that I've shown in previous slides. We can also uh, obtain it through magazines. Um, magazines contain short stories, poetry, um, and journaling. Um, all the magazines in this subscription box are Albertan based. So this would be a really great way to start introducing that local materials into a magazine collection, or maybe have a rot rotating display as new issues of the magazines come in. 
And lastly is uh, this right-click e-newsletter. So the newsletter is uh, more so aimed at writers um, as it includes information on things like literary events and opportunities, but it does note things like book launches, signings, and workshops. So this could be a way um, just to have this in your inbox that you can become more familiar with Alberta authors and, and the writers in Alberta and possibly introduce you to authors from your own place of residence that you didn't know existed or people who are local in your community that you can connect with and do events with or, or bring in their materials, have author talks, um, things like that. The next site is the Book Publishers of Alberta. So this is an association um, that has an emphasis on supporting Alberta's publishing industry. Uh, so Book Publishers of Alberta, or BPAA, um, members of BPAA publish books by uh, local, national, and international authors, um, which all helps to provide cultural and economic benefit to Alberta. Now, members of BPAA tend to be publishers um, because the membership fee is quite high. I believe it's $750 for a full member and $300 for supporting members. Um, but I think this site is just a great tool to use for finding those Alberta-based publishers um, to either purchase from or just to identify that content that you want to bring uh, to your library. Uh, I did mention that BPAA helps to publish books by not just Albertan authors, so do be aware that although some of these publishers may be based in Alberta, not all of their materials are necessarily about Alberta or written by Albertan authors. Um, you might have to do a double check uh, or some additional research just to confirm that, but that's really easy to do. Usually the author bio or the book description will tell you exactly um, where the author is from or what the book is about, so you can identify um, whether it's local enough content for you to bring in. Um, so two things to note on here, they also have an annual awards, it's called the uh, Alberta Book Publishing Awards. And so this would be something you can go on, look at years past and just become familiar with Albertan uh, content, or bring it in yourself. Um, and they have a giant list of publishers, so all of their members. Um, so this is something that you can browse through, um, click into the different publisher sites and, and explore the materials uh, to your heart's content. Underneath uh, the BPAA, I have this Read Alberta link here. Now, Read Alberta is it's another site, and it's actually created by uh, the Book Publishers of Alberta Association. And I see the Read Alberta site more as the public-facing promotional tool, whereas BPAA is geared toward like member awareness. That's just how I interpret it. But the Read Alberta site does have similar tabs and information. So they do also have a publisher list, but they have additional resources. So things like articles and spotlights that are specific to Alberta libraries and Alberta booksellers. Um, there's a large emphasis on shopping local on the Read Alberta site. Uh, and for example, some of the articles, uh, one topic was about weeding in Alberta libraries. Yeah, and if you're, not, if you're not familiar, weeding is a part of collection development and is something that should be done continually. Um, another article also had um, a topic about early poetry in Alberta. So all about the, the origins of Alberta poetry and kind of where it started. So this is a great site to kind of keep informed on different types of Albertan content and to just become more familiar with them. Um, the Alberta literature, publishing, book industry in general. There is a tool um, that they're working on, and it's called the Alberta Books for Schools tool. Um, and it's meant to be a database for schools to find Alberta content for the classroom, so maybe more of an education focus. Um, but I think this could be something used as a collection development tool. I don't think it has to be restricted to schools. I think libraries could make use of it. On the site, it says it's launching in September 2022. So it is not quite available just at uh, this moment in time. But I'm going to be keeping an eye on this. And if it's something that I feel is uh, noteworthy, I might send a message over, uh, over PCANS and, and let everyone know about it. 
All right, the last website I want to show is 49th Shelf. And 49th Shelf has, um, well, its purpose is to make it easier for readers to discover Canadian books. So Canadian books in all genres, um, best-selling authors, new talent, um, large publishers, small publishers, content from all across the country. So it's not restricted to uh, Albertan content. But this site has a lot of really uh, interesting tools and features that you can use. Um, they have a search function where you can search over 135,000 different Canadian titles. You can use limiters to limit your search. They have a weekly selection of featured lists and new releases that they put on their homepage. Um, they have short lists from uh, Canadian book awards that they also feature, uh, blog posts with uh, guest posts and author interviews and announcements and podcasts. And they also have a giveaway page. Um, so they, they give away tons of free Canadian books and it's really easy to enter. All you have to do is make a quick account on 49th Shelf. So it just asks for like an email and password. And then you can easily enter these giveaways and maybe win some uh, free Canadian content for your library. All right, so next what I wanna do is briefly highlight some Alberta-based publishers that you can look further into if, if they pique your interest. Um, most of these are taken from uh, the book publishers of Alberta member list. So if none of these are of interest to you, um, I would recommend going to that member list and browsing through uh, other Alberta-based publishers. There might be something there uh, that you're, is of more interest to you. But let's move forward. Uh, Red Barn Books is our first one. So these guys are located in Carstairs, Alberta, and they work with Albertan authors and artists to create material about country living. So about Alberta life. Um, and they have a whole range. So it's, uh, they have like children's books, um, Alberta Blue, um, S is for Stampede, and they have more adult um, aimed content as well. So this is a uh, horsewoman. Notes on living well and riding better. Um, these books are available through ULS. So if you go to this publisher and there's something you find that you wanna bring in, um, we are able to get those in. Rosemary can definitely help uh, order these titles. The next publisher is Frontenac House, and uh, they are based out of Calgary, and their focus is on Canadian poetry. However, they do publish the occasional fiction and nonfiction titles, and so I have examples of those here. Um, so this is Borderlands. It's a it's like a photo art book and they have images from uh, not just Alberta, it's also surra surrounding provinces and states, I believe, but really beautiful photography. Um, Lost Unsolved Mysteries of Canadian Aviation. This has chapters dedicated to uh, Albertan aviation mysteries. There's one on Fort Mac, I believe. And then Tell the Birds Your Body is Not a Gun which is a poetry book written by poet Rayanne Haynes, who is uh, an Albertan poet. This publisher is called uh, Teach Books, and they're based out of Calgary. And what's interesting about Teach Books is that their focus is on science fiction and fantasy. Um, so they have a whole selection of authors. They actually have a whole list um, that you can browse through and clicking into any of the author names, it'll immediately tell you um, whether they're from Alberta or not because it's in their bio. But a lot, of, a lot of the authors I found through Teach Books are Albertan and all three of these authors um, for The Witch's Diary, Tying the Knot and Home for the Holidays are all uh, Alberta based, which is pretty neat. Kind of neat to see um, science fiction and fantasy uh, Albertan themed books. Um, it's always nice to see things that are maybe not uh, nonfiction or more contemporary based. Uh, it's, it's, it's specific, it's niche, and it's, and it's cool to see that. I believe this middle book, Tying the Knot, actually uh, a large part of it takes place in Edmonton from what I was reading, so very cool. 
And then the last publisher is, or that the last one I want to highlight rather, is Durville and Uproot Books, and they are also located in Calgary. Um, and so I've just highlighted some titles here. We have The River Troll, uh, Vistas of the West, which is Poems and Visuals of Nature by various authors, many Albertan, and Stories of Métis Women, and these are both by uh, Alberta-based authors. Um, on Durville and Uproot Books, they actually have a link to a really large catalog um, of Canadian content, and, and many of that includes Alberta content, so this would be something to check out um, as well. All right, so we're in the last uh, portion of the webinar. We're going to go over the resources that are available through Peace Library System. And the first one is the Read Alberta um, books, the traveling displays that we have. So we have three blocks of Read Alberta books, and each block features nominees and winners from the Alberta Literary Awards. So each block would be like a different year of those awards. Um, within each block, we also have some posters and book stands. So the idea is that you would receive the block, you would set up a display with the posters and the stands, and then patrons can browse and check out books as, as needed. Um, it's the same process um, that's currently in place for checking out uh, blocks on the PLS website. And if you want more information, uh, you can check out the blocks page on the PLS website. Um, currently, we have blocks from the years 2016, 2017, and 2019. Um, I'm assuming we don't have more recent years because of pandemic reasons and maybe the project being put on hold. I believe these have been, these books were sent to us from BPAA, but I could be wrong on that. So um, please check these out. If, if I see these circulating a lot, um, this might be something to uh, kind of reinstate and get back up and running again because I think it's a really neat idea. All right, and the last thing I wanna go over is the Read Alberta ebook platform. So this is uh, an e-resource, um, which is a digital collection of ebooks. Uh, and most of these are Alberta-based or by Alberta authors. Um, this was created by the book publishers of Alberta and it, in partnership with the Albertan government. It started in 2017, and the goal was to make Alberta published ebooks available to readers all across the province. Now, what makes this unique is that these ebooks are not checked out through OverDrive or Cloud Library. It's actually done on a separate site called uh, Cantook Station. And so you can access it one of two ways. You can either uh, go to this URL here, peacelibrarysystem.cantookstation.com or we can access it from the PLS website or uh, member library websites. So I have the PLS website up right here, and this will be the same on your, uh, your own library website as well. In the top right corner, we have e-resources. So I'm gonna click on that, and we get a big alphabetical list of all the e-resources that PLS subscribes to. And I'm gonna scroll down to the letter R for Read Alberta eBooks. Okay, so this is where I would click to get access to, to the platform. And before we go in, I'll just highlight some of the resources we have under here. So the first is a new, uh, newly updated brochure. So this is something you can print out and have on display. It has information about the platform and then uh, borrowing limits and then how you would access um, the eBooks, whether you're reading it online, offline, if you're reading it on an e-reader, or if you're reading it on a mobile device. And I'll briefly go over how to do this um, for each of these versions uh, momentarily. We have another brochure uh, that is specific to, oh, where are we? E-readers and Adobe Digital Editions. So if you're not familiar with Adobe Digital Editions, um, this is something I recommend reading. If you are, a frequent user of Cloud Library or OverDrive, Adobe Digital Editions might be something you are already familiar with. So, but we do have that pamphlet available for you. Uh, we have a link to Startup Guides. So this takes you to the Cantook Station, and this is kind of like a, a, 
uh, FAQ of just getting started with uh, tablets and smartphones for reading the ebooks online. And then we also have a video tutorial that's hosted on the Niche Academy. Um, this wasn't made by us. This I'm assuming this was made by Read Alberta eBooks, but it goes into um, transferring eBooks to Kobo e-readers. Sorry, um, that's what this is specific to. So you can click for OverDrive for Cloud Library, but because we're doing Read Alberta eBooks, uh, this is where we would come and read a little bit more information. All right, let's click in. So a few things to note, you do need a library card um, if you're going to borrow eBooks from this platform. Uh, when you first sign in, you're gonna click sign in in the top right corner here, and it'll ask you for your barcode number and your four digit pin. You hit log in. And now we can see my name is up here and it says how many loans I have left and how many holds. So loan periods are for a total of three weeks. Um, they automatically return, so you don't need to worry about manually doing it or having like a late fee or a late slip on your account. It will automatically return after the three weeks. Uh, doesn't matter if it's on an e-reader or a mobile device, it's the same all across. Uh, the materials, most of them are simultaneous use, meaning that multiple people can download the same ebook. Um, and you are available to borrow up to seven titles at once uh, with three uh, additional holds. Now, I've been playing around a lot in this recently, and I haven't found anything that I need to place a hold on yet. So I'm not actually 100% sure uh, whether any of the books actually do require holds or if they're all simultaneous use, um, but which is a bonus for us, right? Because that means we can get access to these whenever we want. We don't have to wait. So just go over the site a little bit before we get into how to download. So this is our homepage. They have recent releases, uh, a little scroll here, and these are constantly updated. Uh, I believe they still, they have stuff even from May, 2022 um, being uh, uploaded onto the site. So it is still um, somewhat active in that sense. Um, we have some selection lists down here. So the 2018 uh, Alberta Book Publishing Award shortlist. Um, so a little out of date, they don't have the more recent years up just yet. And then the Prairie Indigenous eBook Collection. And this uh, book collection was actually added in 2019. Um, and it contains over 200 titles um, from publishers based in Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. Um, and so the, the goal with this collection was to increase access to eBooks with Indigenous content and by Indigenous authors. So a very, a very cool and welcome uh, addition to, to the Read Alberta ebook platform. And then underneath that, we have top titles uh, of the most borrowed ebooks from users. So we have our search bar up here if you're looking for something specific. On our main navigation bar beside our home button, we have catalog. And clicking into that will bring us a, a huge list of all the ebooks and e audiobooks that are available through Read Alberta. And we can use these limiters on the left hand side to narrow down our search results. The featured selections tab highlights the, the same ones that were on the main page. So we have the Prairie Indigenous ebook collection and the Alberta Book Publishing Award shortlist. And then clicking help will bring us to um, that same kind of uh, startup guide for uh, Cantook libraries for the website. So you can click into startup guide and it brings us back to that same one that we took a look at before, before we clicked in. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at how to download an ebook in four different ways, because <laughs> there's four different ways to do it. So we're gonna to go to uh, my name at the top here and we're not gonna worry about this. We're not gonna worry about that. We're gonna to go to loans and holds. So once you've borrowed an item, this is where they're gonna be stored. Okay. I still have one loan left. So why don't we go in 
and actually uh, borrow something so we can see what that looks like. Okay, we'll do this one, A Very Remarkable Sickness by Paul Hackett. I'm gonna click borrow and I'm gonna confirm my loan. Awesome. So it's giving me options uh, of ways to read as soon as I loan it or as soon as I borrow the item, but I can also go to my loans and holds at the top here and I'll uh, have those same options. So the first way to read is to read online. So this means reading directly into your web browser. Um, you will need an internet connection for this. So all you do is click read online and then in a new browser, it opens up the book and you're able to flip through the pages and uh, read as you like. What's great about this too, is they also have uh, settings on the top right here where you can adjust the font size, things like line height, page margins. You can zoom in and out. And clicking out of this and then clicking back in, it will save the, the last page you left on. So for the duration of, of the loan, it's always gonna remember what the last page was. So that's to read it online. Let's say you want to read the ebook on your computer, but you want to be able to read it offline. Maybe you're going on a trip and you won't have Wi Fi somewhere. So, how do we download it to our computer? These ebook files are not, um, they won't allow you to just download it and save it in a folder. You, we need to use uh, what's called the Thorium Reader to read it offline. So, this is the Thorium Reader, it's a, it's a desktop app and you can download it from the Microsoft Store. Um, it's free too, by the way, you don't have to pay anything. But what you would do, actually I'm going to reduce this screen. There. So I have my book here, and instead of reading online, I'm gonna click reading online on a computer. And when I click on it, I have a file downloading in my window here. So all you're going to do is you're going to take your file and drag it into the Thorium Reader. And then it'll automatically import uh, the title into, into the reader. So then you don't have to be um, with an internet connection or Wi-Fi. You'll be able to read this without, uh, without an internet connection uh, whenever you like. You can flip through, make this bigger. and read as you like. Now, when you first um, uh, start up the Thorium Reader and you drag an ebook into, into the reader, it's gonna ask you a security question and it has that listed underneath uh, the reading offline on a computer space here. So it says, when you open this ebook for the first time, you will need to provide the answer to the following secret question as your password. So it'll prompt you, it'll say, what is your username? And then you're just going to copy and paste this and it'll allow you access to use the reader. The next way to read is through an e-reader. And so we can do this. There's a kind of two ways to do this. If you have a Tolino or a Diva e-reader, you would click this link. If you're using a different e-reader, maybe a Kobo, you would click other e-readers. Okay, and that'll download the, the ebook file, and then we're going to drag it into our e-reader um, app, which in this case, we're using Adobe Digital Editions. Um, so if you're not familiar with Adobe Digital Editions, this is how we transfer ebook files onto e-readers. You can make a free account on adobe.com. It's called an, an Adobe ID. But what you would do is we're going to click uh, reading on an e-reader, we hit other e-readers because we're using a Kobo. And I'm gonna do the same thing that I did with the Thorium e-reader. I'm gonna drag the file into Adobe Digital Editions. It'll automatically import. There we go, there's our title. And then I would plug in my e-reader into the computer and it'll appear on the left side here under the bookshelves. And all I do is take my file and I would drag it into my e-reader and it imports it automatically into your device. So very, very easy. 
You can download uh, this Adobe Digital Editions app. You can do it on um, either the, the Apple App Store or the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Store on your computer. All right, so we've done reading online, reading offline on a computer, reading on an e-reader. The last one I wanna talk about is reading um, on a mobile device. And so I'm gonna use my uh, brochure here because there are two different ways that we can read on a mobile device. And each has a benefit and each has a, a negative. So it's, it's sort of like a pick your poison type situation. Um, but let's go, we'll just jump right in and, and, and go through it. The first one and the one that they recommend using is the Aldeco Next app. Um, and this you can download from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store onto your phone or a tablet device. But basically what you would do is you would uh, open up the app. There is a catalogs tab. So you would click on the tab and search for Peace Library System. So we're basically just adding our library just like we would in Libby. Right. And Libby, we add our library and then we're able to browse through the catalog. It's the same sort of idea with uh, the Aldeco Next app. So we're, we've added Peace Library System. We're browsing through um, the Read Alberta ebooks that are available. It's going to ask you to authenticate yourself, which basically just means to log in. So you'll log in with your library barcode and your four digit PIN. And then for titles that are available to download, they are going to have available underneath the title name in green. So the benefit of Aldeco is that you can browse the catalog directly on your mobile device. However, not every title is available. And that is because um, it doesn't support Read Alberta titles with this ACS file type. It only, uh, it only supports this other, other version of a file type. But anything that is available to download directly to your device will have this available in green underneath it. So that's Aldeco. Uh, the Bukhari app uh, works a little bit differently. So same sort of thing, you would download it to your device either from the Google Play or the Apple App Store. Um, for this one, you do need to create a Bukhari premium account. So when you log in, it'll prompt you to make an account. Um, this one does not allow you to browse um, the, the ebook collection within the app. So what you would need to do in this situation is you would need to open a mobile browser on your device. So if you have an iPhone, maybe you're, maybe you're using Safari, you would log into Read Alberta eBooks from your mobile browser. And then same sort of thing that we do on the desktop site, except we're on mobile, you would go to your loans, go to the title you're looking for, and you would click other e-readers and download the file directly to your, uh, to your mobile device. And then when you click on the file, you would open it with Bukhari Premium. So Bukhari Premium is, is being used as a reader um, on your device, sort of like Thorium is being used as a reader on the desktop. Bukhari is, is it for, for, your, um, for your mobile. And then the title, once you say you want to open it up in Bakari, it'll automatically be imported into the app. So the benefit of this one is that uh, all file types, every, every book on Read Alberta is available to uh, read through Bakari. However, you have to do that extra step of going into a mobile browser and, and downloading the file to your device. It does not allow you to browse directly in the app. So it's kind of pick your poison depending on what you're looking for. Um, but those are the two options for reading on, on a mobile device. All right, that is about it. I've gone through all the resources and uh, Read Alberta eBooks content that I wanted to get to. Um, if you have any questions about anything I've shown today or you'd like some assistance with uh, maybe finding Alberta content or local content to bring into your library, uh, feel free to contact me or anyone from the consulting department, and we would uh, love to assist you with that. Anyway, uh, thanks for attending today, uh, and we hope to see you at the next one. Great. Thanks, everyone. Take care.